Well, in A.D. 155, a season of persecution came to an end when Polycarp was mar martyred. He was the bishop, the spiritual leader, in a town called Smyrna. And after his martyrdom, uh, the persecution came to an end at that point. But the other thing that happened was the church that he was a part of, that church in Smyrna, who the eyewitnesses of his martyrdom, wrote a letter out to the other churches in the surrounding area so they would know what, would ha what happened and be encouraged by that. And so what you'll see on the screen is some of the early words the, the church, they, this church wrote out to the other churches to encourage them, just here talking about all the martyrs uh, who were killed. Here's what they write. All the martyrdoms which God allowed to happen were blessed and noble. Remember that the devout describe all things to his sovereignty. Who could admire their courage, their patience, their love for the Lord? They were whipped to shreds till their veins and arteries were exposed and still endured patiently, while even those that stood by cried for them. They had such courage that none of them let out a sigh or a groan, proving when they suffered such torments, they were absent from their bodies, or rather that the Lord stood by them and talked with them. The fire of the savage ex executioners appeared cool to them, because they fixed their eyes on the escape from the eternal unquenchable fire and the, and the good things promised to those who endure. Things which ear has not heard, nor eyes seen, nor human heart imagined, but were revealed to them by the Lord. They finished well, didn't they? The Bible has words that, that describe these people. They, they call, the Bible calls them conquerors. In the end, they conquered, they stood for Christ. The Bible calls them overcomers. They did not succumb to the pressure of the world. The Bible calls them victorious. And that's the picture we have of these early believers from 155 AD and a little bit before in that range. And so you may wonder in your heart, how did they do so well? How did they come to those moments and stay faithful to Christ and not shrink away? Now, we could give many answers to that question. We've read some scriptures throughout the service that would give us all great truth to hang on to in a moment like that. But yet, for this church in Smyrna, we have a very specific answer for them. In fact, some 65 years earlier, Jesus had spoken some words to the disciple, the apostle John, and he recorded the, these words in the book of Revelation. Jesus spoke some specific words to this church in Smyrna to prepare them for moments like this. And as we read these words this morning and study them, you're going to see that this church listened well to those words. These specific words that Jesus spoke to their heart, they had taken to heart. And they were hanging on to those things. And we know that as we read the account of how they stood for Christ. So that's the church we're coming to this morning. But here's my hope and prayer. As we see this church, back in AD 55, hold on to the words of Jesus, that we too this morning would come and take these same words of Jesus that he wrote to them, but we would take them to heart for ourselves. And we would say, Jesus, what you spoke to them, may it bring us comfort and hope and perspective. That's my hope and prayer for this morning. And for some of you, you're in a season of suffering, of pain, of hurt, and these words are exactly what you need to hear today. And then maybe for others of you, you're in a good season. Life is good. It's up and to the right. You're celebrating. You're rejoicing. You're full of joy. Let me just tell you the opportunity you have this morning. See, when we come to moments like this, and what we're going to see in these words to Jesus is he's talking about foundations. What are we trusting in? What are we building our lives upon? And so if you're in a good spot this morning, here's the opportunity. You get to ask yourself, you get to strengthen your foundation and say, this is what I am building my life upon. You don't want to come into a storm and realize you don't have a firm foundation. And so this morning, if you're in a good place, it helps you build that preparing for when the next season of life comes that may be more difficult. 
So we're in a series, it's called Dear Church, it's the seven words of Jesus, or seven letters to seven churches in the book of Revelation, and I hope you've got your Bibles with you so you can follow along. It's Revelation chapter 2, verses 8 through 11. Revelation is the last book in the Bible, so very easy to find. Find that, get the big number 2, the small number 8, and you will uh, be there, and I'm going to read it in a moment. As you're looking for that, my name's Jeff Bennett. I have the privilege of being the lead pastor here at Harbor and to our Harbor Online community. Welcome. We trust this morning and pray you'll be strengthened and encouraged by God's word as well. Uh, look down to me to these words from Revelation 2 verse 8 and let me just read them for us. To the angel of the church in Smyrna write, these are the, wor- these are the words of him who is the first and the last, who died and came to life again. I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. I know about the slander of those who say they are Jews, but are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. (coughs) Excuse me. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for ten days. Be faithful, even to the point of death, and I will give you life as your victor's crown. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who is victorious will not be hurt at all by the second death. And these are the words of the Lord for us this morning. As we see those words, we're going to really break them into two categories. One is what we're going to see initially is the challenge this church is facing. It's multifaceted, but there's really one challenge, you already know it, the challenge of persecution. So one challenge, but then what we'll see after we look at the challenge is we're going to see three words of comfort that Jesus gives to this church. So the challenge, three words of comfort, these three words of comfort sort of build on each other. They're all interrelated, one sort of leads us to the next, and that's how we'll walk through the passage today. So what was the challenge? Well, first look into those words and see the who was the problem. What we see there is this early, what we believe in the first century, was an early conflict between uh, Jewish people and and Christian people. Domitian, the emperor, had, had made mandatory or was demanding emperor worship. And so what we believe was happening in Smyrna, more than other cities, is Jews were active in denouncing Christians to the authorities probably to deflect attention from themselves because they weren't worshiping the emperor either. They didn't want to lose their privileged position in the Roman Empire. They didn't want that threatened, so they were quick to point out Christians. And what this meant was, and again, notice the spiritual overtones of this. This this is a physical conflict with real people, but Jesus is here to clear to say, this is a synagogue of Satan. The, The devil will test you. So he sees that this is not just happening in a physical world, there is spiritual, this is spiritual warfare. And then we see what's happening to these people as a result of these accusations. There's afflictions, there's tribulation, there's poverty. Probably what was happening is because these Christians were not worshiping the emperor, not participating in sort of normal society functions. They were seen as being disloyal to Rome, and so their property could have been confiscated. They may have been the victims of looting by hostile mobs. They could have lost out on employment and thus the poverty, just not able to participate in the normal life of people during that time. Next word there you see in verse 9, they were also being slandered. And then down to verse 10, it continues to grow what they're going through. Look at the words in verse 10. Suffering, imprisonment, persecution, and for some, death. That's the state of this church. Just imagine that little church in the town of Smyrna, they're gathering together, and that's what they're going through every Sunday. That's what they're talking about. They're trying to encourage each other. They're trying to help us each other along. That's the state that this church finds themselves in. It's interesting to note, of the seven churches that Jesus speaks to in the book of Revelation, five receive sort of rebukes or have clear weaknesses. Jesus says, I hold this against you. But when we come to the church of Smyrna, he says none of that. There's no weaknesses. There's no rebuke. There's no, I hold this against you. This church only receives commendation from Christ, only encouragement from him. 
th- this is not a significant church, small in numbers, probably small in influence during that time period. But just for a moment, think of that. Think of that. It's small church, small in influence, small in numbers, under persecution, but yet no weaknesses. Christ is just encouraging and commending them for their faith. Think of today what you think of as a healthy church, the church that Christ would commend and hold up. I think we prayed for three countries, Afghanistan, North Korea, Somalia. Just imagine those believers on this day gathering together in some of the same situations, fearing for their lives. That might be the best picture we can come up with from this text of what a healthy church is, the church that Christ commends for their faith and their trust in him. It's a good image to keep in our minds. So that's the challenge this church is facing. Great persecution, and you've seen the list there, the seven words. But now Jesus says three things to this church to encourage them. Three perspectives he wants to give them. Look down to verse 9. You see the first one there. It's the first two words in the NIV. I know. Jesus just says, I know. I know. I'm aware. I'm cognizant. I'm mindful. It's like he's looking out in this church and saying, I know what you're going through. It's almost like he's saying, I'm there with you. I'm present. I understand. And you think in the midst of all of the struggles of this church, all their fears, their pain, their loss, all the confusion, Jesus is saying, here's the deep comfort I want to give you. You are not alone. I know I am with you. Mark led us off by talking about the love of God. This is all part of that. God loves us. God is the same. We can count on him. He never changes. We find our peace and our rest and our assurance in these words. Jesus saying, I know. I know what you're going through. I'm present. Think of Psalm 23 right in the middle there. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, Or even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because you are with me. That's what the psalmist held on to. That's what Jesus is saying to this church. I know, and you are not alone. I am with you. But he says more than that. Not just I know, but look down. Even though I know your poverty, but yet you are rich. What does Jesus mean by that? They're poor and getting poor. Their property is their being confiscated. They're losing out on employment, potentially looting and riots. They've lost their possessions, maybe even their homes. How could they be rich? What Jesus is marking here is a spiritual dynamic. In, part, in, in spite of their affliction, God has given them spiritual riches. In the midst of this pain and suffering, Jesus is saying, I am with you and you are spiritually rich. When Paul writes in uh, Philippians 3 verse 10, he says it this way, I want to know Christ and I want to share in the fellowship of his suffering. What a prayer. I want to share in the fellowship of the suffering of Christ. Here's what the early church knew, that in those moments of suffering, we could draw close to Christ and we could experience him. They saw suffering as a privilege, not just a sorrow. They saw it as an opportunity where they could have a deeper relationship with Christ. And this is what Jesus is saying. I see your pain, but yet I know that you are rich. You have a spiritual depth and richness to you. Some of you may have a moment in life where you've been through an incredibly hard time And you you know your faith was tested and you look back on that moment and you would say, I would never want to go through that again. Never, I was in over my head at the end of my rope, had no strength left. I would never want to go back to that time. But on the other side, you'd say, but Christ was so close to me then. He held me. He walked with me. He carried me through. And you'd say, I wish I could go back to that moment. The spiritual depth and relationship during that time. That's what Christ is saying. I'm with you. I know And I can meet you and you can know the riches of what it is to walk with me. Let me read a poem that I think first came out on TikTok. It's not the Christian worldview. But sometimes we think it is. And it's inspiring, but again, it's not the Christian worldview, just so you know. But let me read it just for sake of contrast. Here's what someone wrote. I am capable. I am stronger. I am braver. Whatever challenges come my way, I can overcome. 
No matter how hard, no matter how painful, no matter how long, I can emerge on the other side still smiling because my strength and courage were forged in the same fires that I thought would incinerate my dreams, but they never did. They only made me stronger. So as I stand on the other side of the flames, I know there's nothing I can't do. There's hope in my spirit and a fierceness in my soul that won't ever die. So life, I know what I'm, that I'm ready for you. Bring it on. I got this, no matter what you have in store for me, and I always will. That's w- who I am, and that's what warriors do. We fight, rise, keep going, so that's just what I will do. Not true. Not true. The church in Smyrna was not singing that song, right? They were saying, as we prayed, God has given us more than we can bear, and so we're praying, God, may we rely on you. That's what we prayed for the persecuted church. God has given us, God has given us more than we can handle, and in those moments, we know him so deeply and so close that he is carrying us through. That's how we prayed for the persecuted church. Not that they would look inward and find strength, but they would look upward and find Christ and find him ever faithful. For some of you this morning, you just need to hear these words. You just need to hear those. You're in the midst of a difficult time, and you just need to hear, say, God, I know I am with you. You are not alone. And just you just need to experience his hope, his presence, the riches of knowing him. When we are weak, He is strong, so therefore we glory in our weakness so that Christ might ever be more strong in us. That's the first word that Jesus gives to this church. I know, I'm there, I understand, I'm with you. Now there's a second word, look down, verse 10, just simple four words. He's got I know, they're building, second word, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. This is a common scripture, common scripture encouragement. They actually come together. Don't be afraid, and I know, and I'm with you. Look on the screen. You'll see a couple of examples. So do not fear, says Isaiah, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. And then in Joshua, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. You sort of see two ideas being brought together here. I'm with you, and so don't be afraid. We often use this logic. Think if you're at Canada's Wonderland and you're trying to convince someone to get on those roller coasters, you know, the Leviathan or the Behemoth, and you say to them, hey, come on, we'll do it together, right? You don't have to go alone. I'm with you. We'll go on the roller coaster together. That's sort of the logic here that Jesus is using. Hey, we're in this together. I'm going to be with you. I'm going to strengthen you. But yet there's also something else more here. And think of that roller coaster illustration. You go to, you know, you may say, I'm with you, but here's another line of logic we learned, we use to get someone on the roller coaster. We say this, what's the worst that could happen, right? It's, it's going to be fun, right? You're going to enjoy yourself. And they say, this will not be fun. Then you say this, yeah, what's the worst that could happen? You're not going to die, right? There's no ambulance here at the end, right? They're not picking up dead people. You're going to be okay, Come on, let's get on the roller coaster, right? You ever use that logic? That's sorry. Now, as you think about that, listen to Jesus' logic here. We use that logic all the time. You're not going to die. It's going to be fine. Skydiving, whatever activity you want to think of. Look down to Jesus' words here. Verse 10. Do not be afraid. Okay, yeah, Jesus, we know. Of what you are about to suffer. So he's talking future tense now. Here's what's coming, guys. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison. Some of you are going to suffer persecution. And then... Be faithful even to the point of death. Here's Jesus' logic. You know, you know, it's okay. Don't be afraid. Some of you are going to die. And you're like, Jesus, that's not helpful. It's not helpful. That's what we're afraid of. Right? You're supposed to be assuring us. Right? Imagine the church reading this on Sunday. Here, here's, the, you know, here's the word from the Lord. Don't be afraid. Some of you are going to die. Right? Jesus' words. It doesn't seem comforting. It doesn't seem encouraging. And this is where, again, the subjective sense that he is with us, we need to hear that. We need to know that. But Jesus is also teaching great theology here in this time. And he wants them to know an objective truth. So look down to the last line, verse 11. The one who is victorious will not be hurt at all by the second death. So now Jesus now is going to teach some good theology. Right? He's saying the one who's victorious is not going to be hurt at all, not one bit, totally untouched by what? The second death. 
We don't often use that term, do we? The second death. What does that mean? And this is where Jesus wants us to know something. Second death is a Jewish expression coming from the Old Testament. It compares two things. One is the first death or the physical death, all the death that we all must suffer. But then the second death is the fate of those who are destined to never escape the power of death. So the first death, we all suffer. The second death, those who are destined to never escape its power. Look how John, later on in the book of Revelation, talks about the second death. You'll see this on the screen. Here's what it says. For the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the adulterers, and all the liars, they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. So what's John teaching in those verses? There is a judgment that comes at the end of the age where some are cast into the lake of fire and this doom, this fate, is to die twice. Here's what Jesus is saying to the church in Smyrna. You may experience the judgment and the wrath of other humans, but that's small compared with the suffering of the judgment of God. Here's how Jesus himself said these words. You'll see it on the screen. Matthew 10, 28. Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. What's Jesus communicating here to this church? He's saying honestly to them, for some of you, martyrdom will end your life. But there is a limit to the persecution. You might be hurt by the first death, the physical death, but you will never be destroyed. You will never be cast away. Your true life is guaranteed by God. See what Jesus is saying here to this church? He's telling the truth. Some of you may die by persecution, but you're all going to die. And what's his point here? The first death, the physical death, is not the enemy. It's not what we have to worry about. It's the second death that is far worse that we should be concerned about. The first death is unavoidable. The second death is not. Death comes to all, but eternity with Christ on a new heaven and a new earth will not come to all. And as you think about what happens in our day and age today, more, more people spend a lot more time thinking about how to avoid the first death than they do thinking about the second death and how to spend eternity with Christ. And so this morning, if you are in Christ, if you are in Christ, here's what Jesus is saying. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of the first death. Don't be afraid of the physical death. Hang on. I got great theology for you. If you are in Christ, you are saved from the second death, and you will spend eternity with Christ. Your life is in his hands. It is guaranteed. That's the truth that Jesus wants you to see, that physical death is not the enemy. Hang on, hang on, let that give you hope. And even as I say that to those who are in Christ, let me just pause for a moment. I talked earlier as we began about building a foundation and seeing, asking us where we stand on certain things. And so as you might think about your own life, in regards not to the physical death, but the second death that we've just read about, where do you stand? Where do you stand? Are you sure that you would escape that second death? That, that's the real issue that Jesus is bringing us here to this morning in this text. And if we go back and look at those words in Revelation and you see the long list of sins there, you might try to look at that list and say, am I going to make it or not? Here's the reality, here's the biblical reality, that if we honestly look at that list, it applies to all of us. Not one of us meets the standard. We all have fallen short. If that's the list of who escapes the second death, none of us are going to escape it. That's the biblical reality when we humble ourselves and see that. And so what do we do? What do we do in that predicament as we humble ourselves and see that that list applies to us and we are in jeopardy? What do we do? Look back into the text. A little bit earlier, here's what Jesus says. I will give you life as your victor's crown. More on the victor's crown later, but the first half is great. I will give you life. Give you life. So here's what we were learning. 
Jesus says, not all of us have fallen short. None of us meet the standard of eternity, but yet he has a gift for us. The gift is life. And all we have to do is receive it. All we have to do is take it. What are we counting on to save us from the second death? It can't be our own goodness. Our own goodness is not enough. The only thing it must be is trusting in Christ, turning from our sin and falling on Christ. And that takes humility to admit that our goodness will not be enough. That's what Jesus is saying. Now, for others of you today, you might need to humble yourself to accept that free gift offer to realize your goodness is not enough. For some of you, you look at that list and say, it's a little bit too short. You could add some other things on the list for all I've done in my life. And the good news for you today is that Jesus still offers the free gift to you. We all have fallen short. We all are sinners. There is no difference. And Christ says to you, I love you. Won't you receive the gift that I have offered for you? At times we can think, oh yeah, I, I get this. Just one day I'll get before God or I'll, one day in my heart I'll just say, God, I'm really sorry for the sin I've done and he'll just forgive everything. And there's some truth in that, but it's really incomplete. See, if, if you've done wrong, if you've committed a serious crime and you stand before a judge one day, you can go before the judge and say, God, I'm really sorry to the judge you know, I'm really sorry, please forgive me. And the judge is going to say, well, I'm glad you're sorry. But you've committed a serious crime and you need to pay the punishment for that crime. Just simply asking for forgiveness is not enough. I'm a just judge and I'm going to justly sentence you to the punishment that your crime deserves. That's true of human judges and it would be true of God. It's in that moment when we realize that our sin has brought a condemnation and a punishment that we look to Christ. And he steps in and takes the punishment for us. When we read these words in these verses about what the second death means, we see at that moment that Christ took our place. He bore all of that for us. And what it means is then we turn to Christ and we say, Jesus, you took my place. And you brought that infinite penalty on you on the cross. And so I put my trust in you. Nothing of my own, not my good works, just in you and your love for me. And it's in that moment he grants us his forgiveness based on what he did for us on the cross. And so again, do you know where you stand on the second death? First death is unavoidable. The second death is not. And maybe this morning in your heart, you would just say, Jesus, I put my trust in you. Nothing of my own. I just come humbly to you, receive your love, receive your work on the cross. I trust in you. Would you do that this morning just in the quietness of your own heart? So these are the words that Jesus speaks to this church to encourage them. First, I know. I'm with you. You know, this subjective sense of we can know the riches of Christ. Then the second one, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Death's not the enemy. Death's not the enemy. I've defeated that and you will never experience the second death. And then he says a third thing, third thing to encourage them. Look down, end of verse 10. Verse 10 is a long verse. Here's what he says. Verse two words, be faithful. Be faithful. Hang on. Second Timothy says this, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. That's not a great promise we often memorize, but it's true. Anyone who wants to live a godly life will be persecuted. Don't be surprised by it. Keep barren witness for Christ. Be faithful. Hang on. Don't forget him. Don't be a coward. Be courageous. Don't succumb to the world. Overcome. Here's how we might say it in any suffering or pain. Will we praise him in the pain? Hold on to him. And he gives such a wonderful promise for all who will do that. See the second half of it? I will give you life as your victor's crown. That's the promise now that Jesus lays out. In the city of Smyrna, apparently, just the way the geography turned out, uh, they, were, they had a lot of sort of crown imagery. Uh, the city uh, had the symbol of their city as a crown, and on their coins, there was a crown, apparently. And so crowns was something very common in this city. And you got a crown if you won an athletic competition. You got a crown if you went to a party celebrating the emperor and worshipped him, this crown of garland on your head. These Christians weren't getting any crowns not in the city of Smyrna. They were disenfranchised. They were hated. They were kicked out. There was no crowns coming to them. But Jesus says, I've got a crown for you one day. I will give you 
the victor's crown. Think of what that would have meant for them. You mean, we get a crown from you, Jesus? We see that you, you've seen what we've gone through, that you're honoring it, that you're accepting it, that you're praising us, that you're commending us. Jesus, one day you will recognize all of this and we will get a crown. That's what Jesus was saying to them. And he was saying, hang on, hang on, be faithful to Christ, be victorious. And we know that they did just that. I read at the beginning the letter the Church of Smyrna wrote to surrounding churches. Let me end by writing specifically how their leader, Polycarp, died. And in a moment, you'll see it on the screen. Before I read the first slide, just a little bit of um, uh, understanding. In those days, Christians were called atheists because all the, other, all, the other, uh, all the other gods had temples and had statues. And so everyone could see their gods. And so they looked at Christians and said, you're atheists because we can't see your God. Right? He's invisible. So that, that's just important to understand in the dialogue here so you understand what they were asking Polycarp to do. So on the slide, in the screen here, this is how Polycarp died, the Bishop of Smyrna in A.D. 156. As Polycarp was being taken into the arena, a voice came from him from heaven. Be strong, Polycarp, and play the man, or be strong and be courageous. No one saw who had spoken it, but our brothers who were there heard the voice. Then the crowd heard that Polycarp had been captured. There was an uproar. The proconsul asked him whether he was Polycarp. On hearing that he was, he tried to persuade him to apostatize. Have respect for your old age. Swear by the fortune of Caesar, repent and say, down with the atheists, meaning down with the Christians. Polycarp grimly, grim, and, and wicked, Polycarp looked grimly at the wicked heathen multitude in the stadium, probably cheering his execution, and gestured towards them. He said, down with the atheists, down with you who don't believe in God. Be strong in the end. Next slide. Swear, urged the proconsul. Reproach Christ, and I will set you free. Eighty-six years I have served him, Polycarp declared, and he, is not, he has done me no wrong. How can I blaspheme my king and my savior? I have wild animals here, the proconsul said. I will throw you to them if you do not repent. Call them, Polycarp replied. It is unthinkable for me to repent from what is good to turn what is evil. I will be glad, though, to be changed from evil to righteousness." If you despise the animals, I will have you burned. Threaten me with fire which burns for an hour and is then extinguished. But you know nothing of the fire of the coming judgment and the eternal punishment reserved for the godly. Why are you waiting? Bring on whatever you want. Last slide. When the pile was ready, Polycarp took off his outer clothes, undid his belt and tried to take off his sandals, something he was not used to as the faithful always race to do it for him, even wanting to be the one to touch his skin. This is how good his life was. But when they went to fix him with nails, he said, leave me as I am, for he that giveth me strength to endure the fire will enable me not to struggle without the help of your nails. And that's how Polycarp died. You can read more online some of the miraculous things that are said to happen during that time. 86 years I have served him, and he has done me no wrong. How can I blaspheme my king and my savior now? He was faithful to the end. Let me pray for us as we close. Maybe just let's return to the idea of, do you know where you stand in regards to the second death? If you've never repented from your sin and put your trust in Christ, might even in the quietness of your heart, you, you do that now. Just turn to him receive his forgiveness, receive the love and the transformation that he wants to offer. And then for some of you, in a time of suffering, of pain, of hurt, and you've heard this morning that he's with you. Don't be afraid and be faithful. Maybe for some of you, you just need to pray that back to God or Pray that for someone else. But let's just take a moment and say, oh Lord, may you help us. So Father, we uh, read 
these words from Polycarp this morning, and we are inspired, we're encouraged by his faithfulness. But God, we're reminded that all we see in him is only you. Only you, God. You were his strength. And so, God, we can look to you in the same way and receive all the same that you offered him. And so, Lord, may you help us in our pain, in our suffering, in any persecution that would come to remain utterly faithful to you, Lord. Not in our own strength, but in your strength. We pray this in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. In a moment, I'll invite you to stand and we're going to